Welcome back to my procurement podcast. As always, I have exciting guests. My guest today is Sheldon Müdert. He is the founder of Supeco. Supeco is not only an SRM platform, no, it is the first SRM platform which is really focusing on relationship management and Sheldon will give us a lot of USPs of this platform when we are having our interview. He started just in the middle of the pandemic. So on the one hand, it was a very bad timing, but on the other hand, he invented just the right platform for the right moment. Because since the pandemic is gone, Supeco is really, really successful for supply chain professionals when it comes to SRM, because it's really focusing on the relationship area. Sheldon has more than 30 years experience in supply chain and other management functions. So I will talk with him on the one hand about how he started Supeco, but on the other hand, how supply chain management changed in the past years and especially since the pandemic. So as usually, you should stay to the very end of my podcast because I can tell you that Sheldon gives a lot of information. He's talking all the time with really, really great information. So stay to the very end that you are not missing anything of the information Sheldon will give you. And if you haven't done it yet, please subscribe my podcast, switch on the notification bell because then you make sure that you are not missing any of my future content. So now let's start with my interview with Sheldon Müdert. Have fun and see you in the end. Sheldon, welcome to my podcast. I'm very happy to have you here today. You have a long history in the supply chain, supply chain management. Please give us a short introduction about yourself. Certainly. Hi, Mark, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I have been around a bit, uh, I think it's fair to say. Um, 20 to 25 years uh, in, in the business stroke procurement industry, supply chain industry. Um, working as a practitioner, working with organizations that were going through structural change, outsourced divestment, merger and acquisition of late, digital transformation. Um, for me, always uh, coming at it from a very kind of relationship centric position um, mm. and, and helping organizations to expand on relationship value through through as they transition through structural change. Um, it's an area that I've always had a lot of a lot of real passion for, to be honest with you. Um, going back mm. even further, you know, since I started my my first business, which was at age 17, actually, uh, I started an electrical contract. Oh, 17 well, already. I'm only 25. I know I look oh. very I just look a bit weatherbeaten. <laughs> so yes, um, it's been an interesting uh, a, 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 an exciting, you know, journey. To be honest with you, that that led to that led to the the kind of conception of Sapika. Mm -hmm. How much more do you want me to go into? I can go into. I can talk about this for hours. This particular subject on on the, on the <laughs> background that, that that led to the no. birth of the platform. <laughs> um, I think I. I think. Uh, no, that's fine. Maybe you can say a few words when 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 you started uh, your career in procurement and supply chain uh, 25 years ago, or if you said you already had your first job with 17. This is uh, obviously even longer ago. So, what is? Uh, how did supply chain management change in this time? If you see procurement supply chain management today, uh, um, compared with the days when you started, what has changed then? How did the profession change? Well, I think supply chain. Um, was invariably seen as as a bit of an overhead, you know, as a cost center, um, uh, and, mm. and as is the case for, for most over, many uh, for most overheads, the emphasis is is going to be on driving cost down. So it was it was always very spend focused, um, and and procurement, yes. as you know, has been going through changes of its own. Uh, the way that it's involved, the way that it's evolving, uh, reskilling, upskilling. There's so many different debates on that. Um, but but purist procurement, which was generally very spend orientated as well, um, would would also be looking in mm -hmm. on supply chain and driving cost. Quite rightly so, of course. Um, so you've 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 had these two almost barriers 
to entry in terms of doing anything else but drive numbers, mm. drive numbers down. So, 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 I suppose consequently, I'd say supply chain was uh, was quite a rigid, a rigid process, a rigid model, business model, um, being as taut mm. as mm. possible, if you like. Uh, making it the, the, the quickest point between the quickest route between two points. Very numbers driven, very efficient, you know, yeah, just in time mm -hmm. purchasing, large cross yes, country yes. sourcing type models. Uh, and it was like that since since, since forever. Let's let's face it. Um, and uh, you know the the early attempts to to you you only gotta look back well look back as far as the early eighties, Peter Crowjick, papers that he wrote um uh for the Harvard Business Review Harvard Business Review uh you know, that great paper that looked about that, that talked about procurement and supply and management having to do something different. You know, they we, we need to look at driving other processes, mm -hmm. more mature uh or sophisticated processes to 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 up the game. Um all of which yes. became very adversarial because they were still quite Number driven, numbers driven models, um, and so the changes never really, never really took hold. Um, attempts to drive early SRM supplier relationship management never really took hold because you know they because we were still very much driving this this numbers driven model, um, and the relationship space was always this 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 nice to have it was a bit of a woolly term because it was so subjective with no mm -hmm. real materiality to it nothing to to um you know to turn into something objective that was measurable none of that really existed um and so it was pushed to the side so the, the, you mm -hmm. know the, so, so supply chain for many many years has been this 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 rigid numbers driven model um, and I have seen that because so uh, you're know, working in working in the space um, over the years. I was always a bit of a spreadsheet geek as well, uh, and I and I'd use these spreadsheets, these formulas mm -hmm. to try and emulate subjective type behaviour and creating these formulas that would that would literally turn it into something objective that could measure it objectively in order that we could then measure. Yeah, and it was always it was a bit of a bit of a dark art. There was there was nothing particularly empirical about it, mm -hmm. uh, because the subject nature by very yeah, you know, yeah. the, but but the subject by very nature was very subjective and woolly, um, and so it was always very difficult. It was like pushing rocks uphill. Uh, even though I've you know I always had this burning desire to say, hey, the relationship is ultra important. It really is. It's the atom at the center of everything. Um, but these two big barriers, supply chain, the overhead, purest procurement, they're pushing in hard and they out, they, they just overpowered the desire to do anything different, anything a little bit more nuanced. Mm -hmm. Um, time went on and things, you know, you think, think you, disruption, we've seen disruptions for, for many years, uh, but nothing sufficient. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a inappropriate word. There, there was, I'd say, there were no disruptions that 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 were enough to make people, the industry, sit up and listen. So, hey, let's do something different. If you think about the way the markets are driven, um, the markets generally are driven by the gaps between disruptive events. Mm -hmm. And disruptive events have been around yes. for years, long before the pandemic. Um, but the disruptions that we've seen have generally been regional events. So you've got a catastrophe happening in one part of the world where in another part of the world, the markets mm -hmm. are, are, are steady. Um, and, and that's been happening for years, yes. whether it be regional wars or, or, or hurricanes or earthquakes, whatever, it, you know, or, or, or pandemics because obviously COVID wasn't the first and probably won't be the last. Um, mm. But nothing mm. had the effect that the pandemic had. So before going into the pandemic, the, the, obviously the, the COVID mm. pandemic. So you did, 
So you think that so you think that uh, the COVID uh, pandemic was the big changing point uh, changing point uh, for supply mm -hmm. chain management, or was this already before? Because everything what you just uh, dis discussed or what you, what you what you described, um, the situation before, when did this change? What was the changing point? So I I, I 100 think that that was the catalyst. 100 percent um the, because there was a big difference there, there, there was a there was a big change that happened then uh, uh something very different about the pandemic so disruption was around for years but with huge gaps in the market in, in between disruptions and that drove the market mm -hmm. um but when the when when covid happened the market flatlined simply because uh the, or i should say activity flatlined globally there were no gaps because everything closed down at the same yeah. time. The world yeah. closed down. We all know that. Um, uh, and so the markets had no choice but to almost reinvent themselves. Um, what else could they do? Mm. The paradigm had changed. The premise had changed. Mm. Um, mm. And it mm. was round about, the, the, it, was, it was during the pandemic that we heard every analyst out there from uh, from from McKinsey to Gartner and everybody in between, for that matter, um, and the messaging was: procurement and supply chain professionals now need to invest heavily in relationship-driven resilience. That's mm -hmm. the difference. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. difference. And do you think that? And now, now, now the pandemic is gone for I don't know two three years. Um, do you think this has changed now? I mean, is supply, are supply chain managers and procurement managers focusing more on relationship management with their suppliers, with their partners, or is this just uh, a matter of voice and in reality it hasn't changed much? Uh, what is your opinion about that? My opinion is that things have changed dramatically. My opinion is that mm -hmm. um, most CPOs get it. Um, they understand mm -hmm. that driving a bottom line is not the way forward. It's not sustainable. Um, contracts, it's, I speak to many CPOs, many, um, as, you, as you can imagine. imagine. And mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a recurring theme. When I speak to CPOs, they say, well, we've seen SRM before lots of systems but none of them yes. do relationships none of them uh, there are a flavor different flavors of kpi dashboard and i get that because they're addressing as i described earlier that that, that product market fit which is a numbers driven model um uh, um mm -hmm. you know the, the the cpo uh at bae systems uh said it perfectly and one of our customers they said it perfectly um coming off the back of the pandemic we are going to need to find other ways to meet the value targets because a numbers driven or a, or a traditional numbers or category driven approach uh, or numbers driven approach um isn't going to be sufficient because in recession economics mm. Uh, when recession economics kick in um, and business shrinks as it does for various reasons inflation etc um, mm -hmm. mm. your pre-negotiated margins shrink as well simple math whereas the value targets yes. are still up yes. here um, and so the point was the point made was well, how are we going to meet these value targets that are still up here We're going to need to look up instead of down. We're going to need to collaborate with our suppliers uh, and explore co-resilience. I always use this expression co-resilience. I don't say resilience, I say co-resilience because that's the name of the game. It's, it's true collaboration. You're looking up, you're working with your partners. It's co-resilience. It's, it, 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 it's for them and for you. Yes, um, yes. It's an attitude. It's an attitude, change in attitude. And yes, I have absolutely seen it because the more conversations we have, uh, the less resistance we see. Uh, which tells me that, that, um, that things are changing. And SRM is a very exciting 
place now. There are some amazing solutions out there. We're one of them. Glad to say. Um, Mm. But he said, but he said, but he said before that uh, the um, SRM systems they were not really focusing on relationship management; that they were more number driven. And uh, now you say uh, they exist, and you are one of them. So I think first of all, your system um, really found uh, the the right niche, the right necessity, so that you came in the right time. But you say that other SRM systems they also um, take advantage of this and they changed uh, the technology. Is this right? I think the technology is evolving. Technology always evolves anyway it has to i mean SaaS technology iterates constantly mm -hmm. um, as does ours it's always modifying it's always you know you've got a great you know roadmap um so you know, we come at it slightly differently we come at it relationship first um because we think that so we've, we've actually created something called the digital relationship layer It's, it's an interesting space. If, think about it this way. Um, 90% of company data is unstructured data. Um, yes. And that data is largely operational data. Because we don't live in, the con we don't live in a drafted mm. contract. We live in the real world. I mean, what we're doing now, we're, we're discussing, uh, and if we were transcribing this, if we were a note taker on this call, um, it would be turning that into, into data, unstructured data that we could then analyze. Um, and we do that all the time. We're doing it for years with email and documentation and chat and you name it. It's all unstructured data. And we've, we've done this for years. But what we've also done mm -hmm. for years is pretty much ignore it, ignore the value that's inherent in that data because we've been focusing on that numbers-driven approach. Mm -hmm. um, and... That's one of the big challenges. Mean, you've only got to look at, you know, Gen AI, for example. It's it's playground. It's data playground is unstructured data. It scrapes the web, doesn't it? Um, so this is where we've come in slightly mm -hmm. differently because we've we've created this digital relationship layer for all of that unstructured data, all of this operational engagement across the ecosystem. We pull all of that data in, curating it, creating it. Um, compartmentalizing it into this digital relationship layer, this infrastructure. Um, and then we analyze all of that data. I mean, I won't go into the nitty gritty of it now, um, but we very much come at it from a relationship first position. Um, and that and that is differentiating. And obviously we're using Azure AI. We've got a partnership with, with Microsoft uh, to, to, mm. uh, to um, you know, to deploy our, to innovate and, and, and continue to push that, that solution out. Let me just take a quick drink. Mm -hmm. When did you, when did you, when did you uh, found Supeco and was what the, the reason at this time uh, to start uh, with this business? So we started the business. So the business was actually formed, if you like, created 2017, August. Uh, we didn't actually launch to production. Mm -hmm until mm -hmm. 2020, April. Um, so we did some trialing. We did, we, mm -hmm. we ran a, a several product market fit uh, uh, um, pilots across um, across our first customer actually um, in the UK and in the US. And we launched to production in 2020, April, just as the first lockdown happened, which was interesting. <laughs> very unconventional start to a business let me tell you the first thing we did was say oh okay let's not let's not sell anything yes. then because it would have been a waste of investment nobody was going to buy our software <laughs> everybody was going into furlough yes. and the world was closing down as we've been as we've been saying so um we thought right, we won't sell we'll double down on building the brand so they kind of wheeled me out obviously you've been around in the industry a while mm -hmm. so i started you know, talking, sponsoring shows, panel talks, whatever, um, building our brand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we licensed for the first time in 2021 to BAE Systems. Um, and and we our first mm -hmm. case study, I think, went out halfway through 2021. And we originally, we initially hired a PR firm and they, 
and we and we kind of wrapped a, a press release around that case study and we pushed that out to the industry um again still mm -hmm. kind of in the pandemic at this point really tail end um so it was a very very interesting exercise an extremely unconventional approach quite hazardous quite exciting um but yeah it, unconventional but it but it worked it really did it, it mm. created a wave mm -hmm. of interest so you're pretty you're, you're still so you're yeah, still pretty uh, young system. Yeah? So basically you came to the market in 2020, as you said, but then there was pandemic. So before 2021, um, there were not that many customers. So we are now having uh, 2024. So it's uh, less than three years that you're actually on the market, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, been, uh, it, it's been a bit of a roller coaster with everything going on in the world. Yeah. But mm. we picked mm. up, we picked up more, more, you, more, more fantastic customers, more fan, more, more amazing partners as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I think it, it's a really, really so what amazing that? time for for supplier relationship management. Yeah. Very, very topical topic, uh, topical subject. Yeah, yeah. So I think. So I think on the one hand, you are very unfortunate to just have uh, the pandemic when you wanted to start. But in the end, uh, it was just the right moment, because as you rightly explained, um, supplier relationship management is much more important now than it was probably. It was always important, but it is now much more in the focus uh, than it was before. Mm -hmm. What are the, if, if, I mean, as you rightly said, there are also other SIM uh, systems on the market. What is the main USP um, a customer would have uh, to uh, by choosing uh, Supeco, and why have so many customers already chosen your system? So there must be a great USP for your system in comparison to others. The biggest USP is the digital relationship layer. Um, the 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 mm -hmm. infrastructure, the the foundation within the platform that allows us to bring all of that unstructured data together to create a private. Um, unstructured data, uh, uh, I don't want to call it a large language model, but the, it really is a differentiator to create something that can bring all of that unstructured data together, a private view of un a pr mm -hmm. private uh, uh, um, unstructured data set. Private, what I mean, when I say private, I mean a customer's business ecosystem, including its supply chain. Um, that uh, and, and then the mm -hmm. ability to to uh, really leverage that data that's not been done before uh, that, that's part partly uh, mm -hmm. thanks to gen AI of course with with the innovation that's come through um, I mean that 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 is truly a differentiator there is not a there isn't another company that does that at the moment Um and uh, so, yeah, so that's the first one. We've also uh, go into all the other functionality on the platform, such as the KPI engine, the creation suite, etc. Uh, the the the, um, the the frictionless environment that we've created. Um, so you've got the four pillars infrastructure, which is the digital relationship layer that I was referring to. Uh, then you've got all of the the actionable insights. Um, everything on the platform is live. Uh, there's only we only do live data. There's no point in doing static data. We're talking about digital transformation here, so it's inherently different. Um, so you can't plug static data into a, a into a digital platform. It, it just becomes your biggest weakness. Um, and if you want to drive truly actionable, meaningful, and actionable insights, you have to use live data. Otherwise, they're, they're hardly actionable. You can't say something's actionable, but we're using data that's mm. coming from an old governance mm. regime. Mm. So live data, mm. actionable insights, mm. um, the omni-channel environment that we've created for the entire ecosystem, not just tier one, tier two, tier three, <coughs> true access um, for your partners. Um, you know, there's a, there, there's a big play uh, on, on, on driving sustainable engagement sustainable supply chains and this is another big thing for me okay i truly believe that in order to be truly to be effective and to drive a, a sustainable supply chain you've mm -hmm. got to drive the relationship first 
because a lot of the supply chain are smaller organizations, remember? Absolutely. I mean, the further you go yes. upstream into supply chain, mm. the smaller those companies become. And we already know there are 90, 90% of companies out there are SMEs, SMBs. Um, and the further mm. you go upstream, the smaller those companies become. And just under half of those companies have zero visibility of their produce once it leaves their premises. They're too busy trying to pay the bills. Mm. The problem with mm. that is that mm. legislation, That's as we cool. know, is increasing exponentially around the world. And it, it, it lands on the customer's doorstep. And where does it go? It gets pushed straight out into supply chain, as you'd expect, because 80% of that customer's revenue, that company's revenue is generated outside its borders by its supply chain. So the legislation has to go out. Um, and then you think of these these challenges, you know, with so many of those organizations having no idea about their produce once it leaves their grip. They're just moving mm -hmm. up. They, some, you know, a quote from one of the, an organization we were speaking to, they're an, they're an SME. They said, we, we don't even know who the customer is. We're just a, we're just a sandwich filler. You know the ham in the sandwich. We don't know who the customer is, mm. and so when they mm. get asked yeah. to do things and, and and comply with different standards, and they they don't they, they shrug it off, and that's what they've always done. The difference mm. is the legislation mm. now has mm. teeth. So, so everything everything what you are everything what you are saying sounds very logical and extremely convincing. So my question is always when I speak with people yeah. like you and hear so many uh, convincing stories. Uh, what made I mean in 2017 you had the idea to to start Supeco? What made you start this company in 2017? What was the initiative that uh, made you start this company? And why did no one else uh, did the same what you are doing? There are so many uh, great uh, IT companies in this world. There are so many uh, um, e-procurement uh, providers. There are so many uh, mm -hmm. great uh, also procurement and supply chain companies. So so why did no one else have this idea uh, that you had in 2017? And um, how did you manage as a startup to basically uh, win this cake um, or win this piece of the cake uh, in this area? So I, look, how did it come about? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd, I'd been doing this for years, as I said, and um, I'd been working mm. on, on various uh, engagements. I was head of supply chain for the Met Police. I was interim head of supply or, or supplier management for Royal Mail Group. Um, various companies, I've, I've been in similar roles. Uh, in GS, I, was, I, was, I was head of uh, mm. commercial vendor management for those guys. Uh, Uh, putting in procurement functions for organizations, creating functions for organizations and improving them. So I've always had this thing. I've always done it. Whether I've, whether it was, you know, before it was creating the solution, it was creating the processes, supplier management frameworks, putting the, the mm. you know, the, the, the tracks in place for organizations so that they could then practice better supplier management. Uh, and category management, etc. So mm -hmm. I've always done that. This was the logical next step for me for a start, actually, to create something that you know that, that could then take it on. Because one of the things mm -hmm. we used to find is that organizations, for example, they go through uh, programs of work, whether it be tr you know technology transformation programs, putting in you know letting cross-functional tower models for their for their organizations, you, you name it. Um, They did, they, they, they'd spend all this money implementing these great processes as part of a bid. But then they'd get to the end of the bid and then they'd all mm -hmm. scuttle off and do the next bid, the next project. And things would come to a bit of a standstill. When what they needed to do, that what they, in my view, they should have been viewing these things as putting the wheels on on the on the vehicle and then learning how to drive it afterwards that's the true value you know you you spend all the money implementing it and mm -hmm. then then you mm -hmm. need to learn how to drive it so that you can continue to drive value out of it and that was always missing so that that was kind of my thinking you know i had, had this inkling this this yearning to create something that would then empower these organizations mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. and do it for themselves um so that was mm -hmm. that yeah, yeah. Really and amazing. as i said for me why why I, I can't speak for the rest of the industry, okay? All I know is that I've always been a very relationship-first person. I've always seen it as the big enabler. You know, for example, if mm. you 
you know, there are plenty of, uh, there, there are lots of offshoots from driving better relationships, clearly. Uh, let's just pick one, risk, risk management, mm -hmm. okay? Um, if an organization, if a company focuses on risk management and, and spends a lot of emphasis on spend management, that's great, fantastic. Um, and they'll get a lot of stuff going on around their organization that impacts and drives the risk picture. Uh, you know, what, what, how risk, what the risk profile across their different parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, of course, but if they were to focus on the relationship and drive a better relationship, then naturally speaking, that risk profile is going to change because the risk, things that factor into risk come yeah. from having a, having how, how you run your relationship. Um, if you have a better relationship, it gives you a better, mm. uh, a re better, it reduces risk. If you, if you have a better relationship, you're going to have better negotiations. You're going to have less problems on dispute. Mm. No, no, fully, fully, all, fully all, agree. Of, all of that. Fully, and that fully agree. That's where I've come. Um, that's always been my position. Yeah. So looking back on the last years when you uh, set up Supeco, and I think you still have a lot of plans ahead, uh, but what were the main, let's say, success factors that you created the company at the point where you are standing in the moment? So also, which you would give, I mean, because there are lots of people in this world who have uh, um, possibly uh, great ideas, also in the area of supply chain, to open their own company, but 99% of them That's will true. never do. So what was or what would be your advice to those uh, people or what was your success factors that you managed uh, to run South Peco in the way it is running now? It's a great question, actually. Uh, it's a great question <laughs> because you're right. The, 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 there, are, uh, there are plenty of great ideas that never see the light of day um, because getting a business off the ground is, is, yes, is not easy. It's very, very difficult, uh, unfortunately. Um, For me, um, I had, so, so when it first started, um, it, it started as, as almost fag packet data, you know, cigarette packet data. Uh, in, in the early days, so let's start planning these things. It was me and, 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 uh, and, our, and our current CTO, Alistair, um, we were, Working, he was CTO and I was uh, supply chain um, head of whatever, and 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 we started talking about this and said, "Look, I really want to do this." So we started planning things out and drawing stuff down, and um, and and we were. I, I was originally a non-tech founder, so you know, non-tech founder is someone with a good idea, mm -hmm. but if you've got a great idea, what do you do with it? probably nothing in a lot of cases, as you said. Um, so as a non-tech founder, you've got to find a way of developing the solution. So the first thing was obviously to find someone else that, that would work with me as a partner. And, and that was Alistair. And we started planning things out. And then the first thing after that was to find a partner to help us build the platform. That's how it first started. Before we started bringing things in-house and doing all of that stuff, the first thing we needed to do was to we ran an RFP and we sourced a development partner. Um, mm -hmm. And we spent a year doing that sourcing exercise, kissing lots of frogs. And so we found a partner that we thought we could work with. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you've got to, you know, without going into too much detail on, on, on all of that, you, you, you've got to find ways of, find a partner, find somebody that you can work with. If, if you've got, shortage of funds then offer equity uh, you know it's, it's interesting it's a, a really interesting statement um that uh jeff bezos made it's a great statement he said if you've got a great mm -hmm. idea yeah. give it away which i always found really intriguing if you've got coming from one of the richest men on the planet if you've got a great idea give it away I mean, he's very wealthy, so he doesn't say something that does. There's got to be some sense in that, right? Because he's very successful. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what he meant was, if you've got a great idea, but you're not able to develop it, then find a way of sharing it 
bring people in, find people that can mm. help you. If it's that, if it is that good of an idea, then people will want to hear you. They will want to get involved in some shape or form. And that is the way to build from nothing. Share. I mean, look, 100% mm. of nothing is nothing, right? Mm. So um, <laughs> if you've got a good idea, give it away. And it, it makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you can actually, if you go into chat GPT and you, and, and you pose that question to open AI or something, it'll give you a good answer back. Actually, it's worth doing. It's worth doing. It's quite inspirational. I did as well. Okay. I, <laughs> I was curious. It. I wanted to know its view. So I did <laughs> a very, very interesting. And that, that's the yeah. kind of thing it said. And it resonated because if you think about it, that's what we did. Uh, I was a non-tech founder yeah, with a great yeah. idea, with a business background. So yeah. I needed to yeah. to partner and, and and hustle. And that's how that's and a lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's very important that you have a, a diverse team. That uh, the strengths that you have. Um, or the, the weaknesses you have that someone else has the strengths for it. So only in a team you can uh, set up something like this. If you want to do this alone, this is uh, more or less impossible. If you've got a good idea, people will believe in you. Yeah. If, it, if it's a good idea, I mean, our, our CMO is, is uh, he's the ex-CMO for The Economist. Uh, so he knows a thing or two about driving subscription mm -hmm. models because he was the one that took The Economist from being a, from being a kind of broad paper to an online subscription. Um, very successfully uh our cfo is ex mckinsey he he's he's you know successfully taken organizations through, through three exits um um mm. yeah i mean we, we've got if we've we've got we've even taken on an investment a chief investment officer as well um and, and we you know it, it's you you've got to bring people in that offer those strengths um it's very very important Mm. Ah, I agree. I agree. Sheldon, I think we are already at the end of our time. It was extremely refreshing to talk with you and I had uh, have much more questions I would like to talk with, uh, discuss with you, but we shouldn't make it uh, too long at this time. So it gives us a good opportunity to continue this podcast uh, in a few weeks uh, with Love. some other topics. But uh, I'm really impressed by uh, what you set up, uh, by your mindset and uh, Really, congratulations and all the best uh, for you, for your company, for your team. And uh, as we discussed last time, you are only in the in UK and USA mostly in the moment. So we have to find a way that you also come to Europe, that you come to Germany, that we uh, find a way and collaboration. So I'm very, very excited about you. Well, we are we, we're operationally um, we are in the US, UK, France, Spain. Australia, Israel, Q8, we are, we're kind of all over the place, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, so we are, you know, it, 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 mm -hmm. it's an expanding footprint. Um, so yeah, and I, no, I'd love to do another talk. Really enjoyed right. it. Really enjoyed it. And if anybody wants to, to mm -hmm. you know, get Perfect. a tour of the platform, they can, they can find me on LinkedIn or the company on LinkedIn, uh, or sapika.com. Uh, just, just click for a demo and we'll set it up. No problem at all. Super. Thank you very, very much and all Thanks, the best. Mark. Take care. I think this was really informative interview and Sheldon gave a clear picture that if you also have an idea to open your own company in supply chain management or procurement, you should first of all believe in your idea and secondly, find partners who you can implement this idea because you will not be able to do everything. You need someone who has the skills which you don't have. So as a team, you are much stronger and I think Sheldon proved this very well with Supeco. So now the most important thing, you should subscribe this channel switch on the notification bell because when you are doing so you are not missing any of my future videos which are interviews with supply chain and procurement professionals which are videos from myself where i talk about artificial intelligence about esg about negotiation where i also show you negotiation skills live so switch on the notification bell and stay tuned on my channel